Welcome back to The Ed Show. A steady flow of leaks and public testimony continues to pour out of the Trayvon Martin case. The latest is Robert Zimmerman's interview with Fox 35 in Orlando, where he gave his son's side of the story. After nearly a minute of being beaten, uh, George was trying to get his head off the concrete, trying to move uh, with Trayvon on him into the grass. Uh, in doing so, his firearm was shown. Trayvon Martin said something to the effect of, you're going to die now or you're going to die tonight, something to that effect. Robert Zimmerman's account of what happened to his son is consistent with the Sanford Police Department's official report on the night of the incident. But both stories are at odds with George Zimmerman's appearance in the surveillance video released by the Sanford Police Department. Robert Zimmerman had not seen this video before he gave his account of the story to the Fox affiliate. George Zimmerman's lawyer was on the Today Show and he told Matt Lauer the tape is not conclusive. When you look at this videotape, do you think it backs up your client's claims or might it contradict them? I don't think it does either one. It's a, a very grainy video. I do, however, if you watch, you'll see one of the officers as he's walking in looking at something on the back of his head. Uh, the, the, the video is very grainy and I'm not sure that it has as far as being able to see uh, the injuries that were recently sustained and then later cleaned up. Robert Zimmerman released a statement earlier this month defending his son. The statement is not consistent with the facts as we know them. Zimmerman wrote, at no time did George follow or confront Mr. Martin. But we know this is not true after hearing George Zimmerman's own phone call to his Sanford Emergency Services. Just straight in, don't turn and make a left. He's running. He's running. Which way is he running? Down towards the uh, other entrance of the neighborhood. Okay. Which entrance is that that he's heading towards? The back entrance. Are you following him? Yeah. Okay, we don't need you to do that. The tape. The tapes are not only proof Zimmerman was in pursuit of Trayvon Martin. Martin was on the phone with a friend in the last minutes of his life. The friend told Martin's lawyers, Trayvon said, what are you following me for? And the man said, what are you doing here? Next thing I hear is somebody pushing and somebody pushed Trayvon because the headset just fell. I called him again and he didn't answer the phone. Robert Zimmerman is once again willing to challenge the facts on the record. He told Fox 30 I don't believe that happened, meaning that conversation. I don't believe she was on the phone with him. And I find it very strange with the publicity involved in this that all of a sudden, after three weeks, someone would remember that they were on the phone. ABC News reported Trayvon's phone logs show the conversation occurred five minutes before police first arrived on the scene. Here's a timeline of what happened on the night of February 26th as we know it. Three big points. At 7.12 p.m., Trayvon Martin was on the phone with a friend. By 7.17, police arrived on the scene of the shooting and Trayvon Martin was dead. At 7.51, George Zimmerman arrived at the Sanford Police Station. Let's turn to John Butchko. He is a retired Miami Police Department homicide detective with 28 years experience. John, good to have you with us tonight. I appreciate your time. Uh, as a homicide detective, what inconsistencies jump out at you from the information you know of this case? Well, first of all, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, as far as the facts that I know about the case, and this is through the media, I don't have the, uh, the intimate details from the Stanford Police Department or the investigation. But the things that jump out at me, <clears throat> first of all, is that uh, in order to use deadly force, that's, it has to be, uh, um, you have to believe there's imminent death or great bodily harm going to occur to you, or it is occurring to you. In this case, I saw the video of Mr. Zimmerman coming into the police station. I don't see that on him. I don't see great bodily harm uh, at, at this point, you have to remember, he's a civilian. He's on a street. He's armed. Uh, uh, Mr. Martin is there on the street also. He doesn't know what his authority is to stop him, and there's a confrontation. In that confrontation, uh, I, I'm understanding that Mr. Zimmerman uh, received a bloody nose and possibly some injuries to the back of his head. 
<clears throat> now, in any type of fight, a high school fight, you're going to have uh, uh, that type of injury. That's not great bodily harm. So, from what you see of this videotape, you would not conclude that there was some kind of struggle that was life-threatening for Mr. Zimmerman? That's exactly right. From, from seeing that videotape, I would conclude that. If there was great bodily harm then, or, uh, or imminent death to him, then he would have been treated on the scene. He'd possibly have been transported to a hospital. Uh, at, at this stage, uh, again, he's a civilian. He's confronting Mr. Martin, and Mr. Martin has the, the same right to try to protect himself and this person uh, uh, confronting him. And I believe that's what happened. Mr. Zimmerman happened to have a firearm on him, and he, and he used it, and I believe that uh, he used it unjustly. How much work you think he used it unjustly? Uh, yes, for the fact that, that there isn't great bodily harm to him. Okay. Uh, I know he gives his story saying his head was being banged against the, uh, the sidewalk and, and that he felt that he had to use force. Um, just what I know about the investigation and what I saw on that videotape, I, I don't see that type of injury. I see a struggle, I see a fight, um, uh, and, and the police are on their way at the time, and it didn't appear that there should have been deadly force used in that situation. Uh, uh, Mr. Butchko, you, you were a homicide detective for 28 years. I want to ask you about the timeline. How much work would have been done at the scene of the crime? Uh, on the phone, Trayvon Martin with his friend at 712. He's dead by 717 when the police officers arrive. And George Zimmerman is in the police house at 751. Doesn't this seem like a rather fast uh, <laughs> turn of events? It is, it is pretty quick. Uh, however, when you get to the scene, what you normally do is you evaluate the scene, you find out who your witnesses are, you find out where exactly your scene is, uh, where your evidence may be. Uh, there's other police officers there that are assisting you. Uh, it's, it's advisable to get the, the, uh, the person who did the shooting off of the scene as quickly as possible, however, without damaging any type of evidence. I mean, there is such a thing uh, as gunpowder residue swabs. Uh, even if you know who did the shooting, you take those swabs to, to prove that at a later time. Uh, those swabs should be taken before the uh, the shooter is removed from the scene. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and do you think that the, the, from what you saw of the videotape that there was the damaging and the contamination of evidence? No, I, I don't see that because, uh, first of all, I don't know what the status is on his clothing. I don't know if sure. his clothing was taken on the scene or not. Uh, if it was not taken on a scene, that's understandable. That happens. That's not going to change. Our blood's not going to come off of that, the clothing. Uh, it's understandable because you don't have a change of clothing for a, for a shooter on okay. a scene. You would get him to your station, and during the course of your investigation at the station with him, you would collect his clothing. And, and finally, Mr. Bushko, how many murders did you investigate in your 28 years? Oh, geez, I, I'd say as a lead detective, over, over uh, 1,200. Okay. Um, and how yes. rare is it that the police would know the identity of the victim but list him as a John Doe for three days? Well, I, I don't know if they knew the identity of him at the time. I don't know if he had identification on him, but I... I well, the police we, report says they did. Okay, if we knew who he was and he had identification on him, we wouldn't have listed him as a John Doe. We would have went with his identification, uh, especially if it was a photo ID. Uh, then from there, the, the priority is to try to find a family and to notify them. Now... Uh, in light of that, this is a, a young man who didn't live in that community. That might have been a, a, quite a task to do, and it might have taken a, a day or so to, uh, to find out who the parents were, were and where they were at the time, because I understand the, uh, the father's girlfriend lived there, and they didn't really have a connection, I don't think, with that name, with uh, Tyron's name. But door-to-door -door would have been the thing to do, correct? Well, you do an area canvas. You automatically would do an area canvas uh, uh, anytime you have a homicide in order to look for additional witnesses. But one thing you wouldn't do, you wouldn't go through a whole neighborhood neighborhood and pounding okay. every door to try to find out who, who this kid is. But what about the cell phone? What, wouldn't that be obviously followed up on by law enforcement? Who was the last person he dialed and a whole list of phone numbers that would be in there to be checked out? That shouldn't take too long. Well, unfortunately it does because we're, uh, the police department is obligated to, to do things legally because you don't want evidence suppressed later on. And part of that is uh, possibly getting a subpoena for those phone records. That's not something that's done overnight. That, that sometimes takes a couple days. And to get the information back also takes a few days and sometimes a few weeks. So the, uh, so the handling of the cell phone doesn't bother you? 
Uh, no, it doesn't, because normally on a homicide scene, you would secure that, that, that cell phone. At some point, you would, you would go through it to find out what numbers yeah. are on there. But if you, you would not just call those numbers, because you don't know who you're calling. Okay. What, what you would do is fi figure out what numbers are on that phone, subpoena those records, then you would find out who they, who they were, and then you would contact them. Now, as, as far as them not making an arrest, the police not making an arrest right off, I'm not too troubled with that because we've had many cases where, uh, especially a case where there's a possibility of safe self-defense. I'm not saying this is self-defense, but if there's a possibility of it, that a, a continued investigation is necessary. Uh, you need to uh, find out what the medical examiner's office is going to say. What is the angle of the bullet, uh, the entry, the exit? Uh, you need to find out what the defendant is telling you. John Butchko, I appreciate your time tonight. Uh, we'll have you back. Thank you so much for the information. Trayvon's parents have reacted to the police surveillance tape, and we'll get the family lawyer's reaction to Robert Zimmerman's interview next. And the right wing is trying to change the story by demonizing Trayvon Martin. Dr. James Peterson will set him straight. Stay with us. We're right back.